Hi, everyone. We're very excited to be here with you. I'm Teddy Prolick. I'm .MTA's Office of Planning Chief of Engagement. Part of my job is to help our office connect with the people who are closest to our service, whether they're customers, operators, community members, so that their insights and experiences can help the agency make better decisions. Today, we're making a recording of the official presentation that we gave at two virtual public meetings on September 22nd and October 3rd, 2022. We're gonna be sharing all the slides, prompts, and discussion topics that we covered in those meetings. We are gonna skip through a few of the response portions, but otherwise, this is our best attempt to make a record for folks of what we talked about so that you can come back and review anything in case you missed it. I'm also joined by Kimmy Darrell, representing our technical team. Uh, I'm gonna start off the meeting with some backgrounds on the project, and then Kimmy will introduce the technical analysis that she and her team have done. We're then gonna go or pretend to go into breakout rooms for some more in-depth discussion where Kimmy and I are gonna go over the specific segments that we were discussing in the breakout rooms. And then we're gonna to return to the main room to wrap it up. So uh, moving on to the next slide. We're gonna skip over some of the Zoom instructions and uh, we'll of course cover those or we are covering those in the real meeting. So before diving in, we'd like to give you a sense of what we are doing here. We're still in the beginning phases of a long-term effort to plan, design and construct major transit infrastructure that goes through a comprehensive federal approval process. So that includes a record of decision following the National Environmental Policy Act, and that's NEPA, the NEPA review process. As you can see right now, we're in the feasibility study, which means that we know the general areas we're trying to connect with new transit service, but we don't yet know exactly where or how to do it. So we're still in the process of reducing what is a huge number of options into a smaller and smaller subset of options, which we're also calling alternatives, so that we can eventually settle on a single choice, which is also known as a locally preferred alternative that can secure federal funding and approval. In this meeting, we're gonna learn about your preferences regarding key trade-offs for each of the seven alternatives so that in future phases, we can focus on a smaller number of options that will receive additional environmental and engineering analysis. So let's go on to the next slide. So to repeat, we really don't know the details yet of exactly what's the best route, what's the best mode, or even where to start and end a new transit service. So your feedback will help us and our regional partners to determine which of these options or even combination of options should move forward to the next phase of study. And again, in that next phase of study, we'll have more details about things like traffic modeling and how dedicated guideways would impact the transportation network. Uh, here in these pictures, you can see some examples of us out at farmer's markets this year, uh, going out to bus stops. Right now, we're in the middle of the public comment period for the North-South Corridor, and we've received actually over 400 website comments. Uh, we've got more than 100 in-person comments from the 10 or so pop-up events that we've done so far. We're planning to do about 20 in total. I guess, and as I said before, we're recording this kind of in the middle of that public comment period. Let's move on to the next slide. So the purpose of today's meeting is really not just to receive general comments, but instead to answer questions that audience members might have that our project team can help to clarify. So in a 60 minute meeting, we're just not gonna be able to provide an opportunity for everyone to share their thoughts. We understand that folks are gonna have a lot of important comments that you wanna share and we do want to hear them. It's just, there's a lot of other ways that you can also provide them to us in the chat function, through email, we're gonna go through the website. Again, for today's presentation, again, for the virtual public meetings, we're really here trying to answer questions that we can help to answer. You've got, again, the full project team here today so that you can get detailed responses. And again, we don't have all night to do this, so we're going to try to get to as much as we can and prioritize, again, those questions that we can help answer. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this is an example of one of the kind of Zoom warm-up poll questions that we're asking folks to get a sense of just who's in the room. We're not gonna spend time on that during this recording, so we can move on to the next slide. And for those who are wondering, that first question was just asking, have people or how have people, uh, how familiar are people with the project so far? 
Um, the second question is asking how did folks hear about this meeting, whether through email or a bus stop notice or a community association. And again, that helps us focus our energy going forward to reach as many people as possible and understand where we're doing a good job, where we need to spend more time. Uh, here on the agenda, you can see that we're going to, again, provide a brief overview of the project. I'm going to then hand it off to Kimmy. We're going to have some more in-depth discussion on each of the segments. We'll then come back and look at a summary and talk about what comes next. So we can move to the next slide where we've got some background on this overall regional transit plan. And uh, of course, as I said before, I am from the planning office, so we work on lots of plans. But this regional transit plan is a little bit different than the typical ones that we work on because it does cover such a large geographic area going from Hartford County to Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and even going down to Howard County and Anne Arundel. I might have said, uh, might have said one twice there, but in total, it's five. And this is not only looking at five central Maryland counties, but also looking out to 2045, so a 25-year uh, vision starting in 2020 when this was approved. Um, this is also a different kind of plan because it actually requires, again, this is coming from the Maryland State Legislature, that all of these five counties are actually working together, talking together, collaborating. Uh, yes, that is something that is worth repeating because it is really important and it actually is happening as a result of this plan. So let's move on to the next slide. Today, uh, we're gonna focus on regional transit corridors, which are a part of the regional transit plan. So here you can see all 30 transit corridors at once, but the commission also identified a subset of what we're calling early opportunity corridors. So that means that they're the first ones that we're gonna study. When we click through on the map, you'll see how those 30 become a smaller number of early opportunity corridors. And then within those early opportunity corridors, we're actually focusing on the east-west and north-south corridors to start. Now we can move on to the next slide. So here's a little bit more information about those corridors. These are ones that MTA, uh, Baltimore City, uh, Baltimore County, and Howard County are working on together. These were corridors that were selected based on data showing transit readiness and also potential to contribute to equitable transportation outcomes including access to jobs and other essential trips. Here you can see what I call the wine bottle and footprint blob map. So you can see in the green, the wine bottle, we've got the east-west corridor roughly connecting uh, Ellicott City to Bayview. And then in blue, the north-south, which is connecting Towson to downtown Baltimore. And again, today we're gonna be focusing on the north-south corridor. Some of you might have been with us earlier this year when we were presenting on East-West. You can check out all that information at rtpcorridors.com. And now we can move on to the next slide. As you can see, we have been working on this for a little while before doing any of the modeling or detailed analysis that we're gonna be sharing today. We spent a lot of time last year talking with folks about their big picture goals and objectives for what these corridors could be, including the places that they could connect, and the larger priorities that they could support. In all of these engagement activities, we put a real emphasis on making sure that we're talking with a representative group of riders and residents. So we've done this by sending out 14,000 randomly addressed survey postcards to area residents. We've done it by sending street teams out to ride buses, in addition to hosting and attending public meetings, posting online materials, and again, going out and talking with residents, whether at their community associations or actually at transit stops. And now let's move on to the next slide where you can see the result, which are corridor specific goals that help us to then create measures of effectiveness, which can actually tell us how each of these alternatives are performing in relation to each of these goals. So. I'm going to read these out loud, and then in the meeting, we ask people to actually rank their top two goals so that we get a sense of which ones were priorities. Uh, here, the first one was increase mobility and access to jobs, services, and other opportunities in the region. The second goal was create strategic connections to multimodal transportation options locally and regionally. The third goal was center equity as a core consideration. Fourth was support the region's economic competitiveness and strategic growth. Fifth was support the region's sustainability goals. 
So we can move on to the next slide where we do ask people to tell us their top two preferences, but we're gonna skip through and move to the next slide where I'm gonna turn it over to Kimmy to again, talk about how we've tried to operationalize and tangibly measure how each of these alternatives meets the quarter goals. And that's gonna be the heart of our conversation today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kimmy. Thank you, Teddy, so much. My name is Kimia Darrell, and I'm a member of the Corridor Study Technical Team. Our team, with, alongside M.MTA, Baltimore City, and Baltimore County, collaborated to define seven options to test based on our market analysis and the project's goals and objectives that Teddy just outlined. The seven alternatives, which I'll detail in a moment, intentionally include a variety of modes, and alignments and station locations and spacing to see how these different options performed, not only in terms of things like ridership, but also measuring access, demographic characteristics, and travel time, among others. Specifically, we looked at bus rapid transit, or BRT, light rail, and heavy rail, or metro subway. These different modes demand different treatments, and some of the alignments that you'll see required considerations such as bridges and tunnels, to make it possible to run the transit mode in the alignment. In broad terms, the alignment choices that you see here on the screen helped us test and explore trade-offs such as ending uh, up at Lutherville or a little bit farther south at Towson, traveling down York Road and Greenmount Avenue, or connecting over via Lock Raven Boulevard, and where to end the transit line at Harbor East or Port Covington or downtown or the Inner Harbor. I'll go a little bit slowly here um, to just talk through the seven alternatives. So our technical team pulled together all of that background research and analysis to have seven different combinations of mood, modes and alignments, which we refer to as alternatives. I'm gonna summarize each here, uh, but a little bit later in the presentation, we'll do some deeper dives in breakout rooms. Uh, and I'll go through each in some detail now though, so that if you're not as able to see the screen, um, but you're listening to this presentation, you can follow along. Alternatives one and two, which on this map are depicted in pink and maroon, both generally follow the alignment of the existing city link red, traveling from Lutherville Light Rail Station, down York Road and Greenmount Avenue, and then terminating at the University of Maryland Medical Center or UMMC. Alternative one is light rail and does include some below grade segments in tunnels due to the road widths. And alternative two is the same alignment, but in BRT. Alternative three in purple on this graphic is another BRT alternative, which connects from Towson to Harbor East via York and Greenmount, and then Charles and St. Paul as one way pairs through Mount Vernon via North Avenue. Alternative four in light green is our heavy rail alternative or Metro subway. And that travels from Towson straight down to Port Covington beneath uh, York Road and Greenmount and then Hanover Street. Alternative five in the darker green follows this same alignment, but with at grade BRT. Finally, alternative six and seven in blue and orange respectively, test an alignment using Lock Raven Boulevard. Alternative six tests this with a light rail from Lutherville to Otterbein via Goucher and Lock Raven. And alternative seven tests BRT from Towson to Harbor East via Joppa and Lock Raven. Again, our breakout rooms will look at some of these key transitions in a little bit more detail later in the presentation. I mentioned that we're looking at three modes in this study. This table on this page defines characteristics for each of the modes, including reliability, average stop spacing, and the average passenger capacity per vehicle, which is a range showing the different types of vehicles that could be used for each mode, and on average about how many folks you can fit on those. As the study progresses, the specific vehicles would be chosen, um, and uh, you know the number of vehicles would be assigned, et cetera. But, here, you can see that heavy rail is completely separated from traffic, making it highly reliable. However, the average stop spacing is much higher with stations every one to two miles, which decreases access somewhat. Generally, heavy rail vehicles can accommodate the greatest number of passengers. It's 70 to 190 passengers per vehicle, 
It also has the highest construction costs. Light rail is mostly separated from traffic, but it still has high reliability. We see closer station spacing here about every half a mile to a mile. And light rail has just slightly lower average passenger capacity per vehicle. Overall, light rail will have medium to high construction costs, and this really depends on the alignment characteristics. And finally, bus rapid transit is mostly separated from traffic and dedicated lanes with associated medium to high reliability. The station spacing is the least for BRT at a quarter of a mile to a mile, resulting in the highest level of access. Vehicles tend to accommodate 40 to 110 passengers. There's a pretty big range there. And construction costs are low to medium compared to the other modes, again, depending on the characteristics of the alignment. Here in the Baltimore region, you're likely familiar with light rail and heavy rail transit. However, we don't yet have a prevalence of BRT. Uh, bus rapid transit includes roadways that are dedicated to buses and gives priority to buses at intersections where the transit vehicles may interact with other traffic. This helps to keep things moving efficiently and reliably. It also includes design features that reduce delays such as off-board payment and all door boarding. So it is not quite the same as the bus system that we currently have um, and, and is a, a far more reliable and efficient mode of transit. I mentioned earlier how we defined measures of effectiveness, or you might hear them called MOEs, based on the goals of the project. Here you can see more specifically some of the ways that we evaluated the seven alternatives. Uh, these are divided by goal, one, two, three, four, five, and uh, then the theme within that, and then the specific quantifiable measure that lets us assess the alternative. Um, for example, under goal one, which was to increase mobility and access to jobs, services, and other opportunities, we looked at things like reliability and travel time savings and access, looking at households within a half a mile of a station per mile or the percent of dedicated guideway. Under goal two, uh, creating strategic connections to multimodal transportation options locally and regionally. We looked at the connections to rail stations, frequent bus service, and the locally operated transit systems, as well as additional future jobs accessible by transit within a 45 minute commute. Goal three, which was to center equity as a core consideration. Here you can see, I'll call it an index measure that measured all transit critical populations within a half a mile of a station per mile. Though I will note that we looked at those broken out um, demographics, low income, minorities, zero car households, et cetera, um, individually as well. Here they're just rolled up into one measure. Goal four, which was to support the region's economic competitiveness and strategic growth, examined themes like cost, development opportunity, and the time it takes to implement. Um, for development opportunity, for example, we looked at transit-oriented development and opportunity zones within a half a mile of a station. And finally, goal five, which was to support the region's sustainability goals, looked at ridership, measuring projected daily, daily boardings in 2045 per mile, and sustainability, examining zero car households within a half a mile of a station per mile. So overall, several key takeaways emerged from this analysis. First, we find that the North-South Corridor is an investment to provide more frequent, reliable, premium transit service, as opposed to creating new service to fill a gap. So, there is already ample transit service here with the City Link Red, which is one of MTA's highest ridership routes, but there is still demand for better service here. Two, most of the alternatives do show significant travel time savings compared to the existing travel time that folks experience today. And all of the alternatives increase access to future jobs for corridor residents by up to 38,000 more jobs accessible. York Road alternatives attract more riders than those that use Lock Raven Boulevard. However, York Road, as you may know, has the most physically constrained roadway width, which presents its own challenges. And finally, the five alternatives that serve Penn Station provide a really important connection to the region's bus and rail transit network. Again, these are derived from the regional transit plan, 
And so those regional connections are important. Here we're gonna walk through a series of, I'll call them breakout rooms, one for the North, one for the Central, and one for the South segments of this corridor. We're gonna dive in a little bit more deeply so you can see some of the key connections or transitions within these segments that you just can't see at this larger scale. In a public meeting, folks would have the opportunity to move between these rooms and join discussions within them. So, in this first north breakout section, you can see a zoomed in section in this in this uppermost uh, section of the alignments. You can see how several, one, two, and six alternatives uh, begin up at the Lutherville station. And those little double lines that you can see there are indicating that for a very short segment on Ridgely Road, you are operating in mixed traffic just to make the connection from York Road into that station. You can see that the three alternatives there travel down York Road and where there's that little pink dotted line, uh, that's indicating that alternative one is then operating in a dedicated tunnel below grade. And this is just due to the right of way widths available. You can also see, <clears throat> excuse me, um, where alternative six and seven then go to the east to connect to Lock Raven. And at the very top where alternative four is also beginning below grade with that heavy rail. So one of the key takeaways that we found in this section is that that connection up to the light rail station at Lutherville adds some pretty significant ridership. It adds about 4,000 riders on alternatives one, two, and six. Uh, some of the discussion uh, items in this section are honing in on how important folks feel it is to extend up to Lutherville from Towson, and they could vote important, neutral, or not important. Looking a little bit farther down, uh, starting from Towson, <clears throat> you can see alternatives four, the heavy rail, and one, the light rail continuing below grade before light rail comes back to surface. You also can see six and seven uh, traveling east, either connecting to Lock Raven via Goucher Boulevard for alternative six or by Joppa to Lock Raven on alternative seven. Some of the takeaways here is that the greater density on York Road does provide higher overall ridership, but when we look at the alternatives using Lock Raven, they do provide more access to minority populations. As many of you may be familiar with or aware, York Road has limited space for transit improvements here, and that's why you're gonna see some you know, below grade portions there to make light rail work. Uh, Goucher can accommodate rail vehicles turning movements, so you see that broader sweep, whereas the BRT vehicles don't have an issue with that sharper turn from Joppa. Uh, where we have tunneling for light rail or the heavy rail turn of four, um, there's the greatest travel time savings, right? It's highly reliable. Um, you're really not going to have any of the, the challenges or setbacks that you might with mixed traffic. Um, but that tunneling creates a lot more cost, environmental complexity, and extends the implementation time. So some of the questions that we talked about in the breakout room here um, were, you know, the fact that there are two primary arterials that we're using to get to downtown from Towson. York Road alignments, and then those that use Lock Raven. And looking more specifically at Lock Raven, if that was the selected route, looking at whether it should access Lock Raven via Joppa or take Fairmount to Goucher before making that connection. So moving into the central breakout room uh, section, you can see here really those, those two main alignments, those that are coming down Lock Raven and the rest traveling down York Road. Um, York Road continues to have higher density and it's serving more low income population here and it has higher ridership overall. Lock Raven still is providing more access to minority populations and continuing we have that real difference between the right of way availability on those two alignments. Um, tunneling is starting again, you can see here for alternative one, um, it goes back below grade once it's on Greenmount for a segment, um, again, due to the right of way width available. 
At the southern section of this graphic, you can see that alternative seven in orange begins to make the connection to the west via 33rd, uh, whereas the others continue south um, when you're looking at alternatives one, two, and three, four and five also make that jog uh, just to the west at this point. So here we're looking at the two primary ways to get downtown from Towson, you know, looking um, from North Baltimore, York Road, or Lock Raven uh, to see what folks in the breakout room in Central thought was the most appropriate connection. Still in uh, the central breakout room, but moving a little bit farther south, here you can really see the spaghetti taking place um, where you're really seeing the difference between where the alignments um, either continue south, um, for example, alignments, alternatives one, two, and three travel down York um, until three then uses North Avenue to cut to the west and make that connection to Penn Station. One and two continue south on uh, Green Mount here. You can see in green, the alternatives four and five, which are heavy rail and BRT respectively, uh, then continue down the Charles and St. Paul one-way pair. Alternative six, which is coming um, from Lock Raven Boulevard is making that same connection, but via 25th Street. And alternative seven, you can see it's continuing down Charles and St. Paul. As you saw in the previous slide, it made that connection via 33rd. Um, Penn Station is a regional transit hub, as you know, for bus and rail, um, and not just light rail, but also MARC and Amtrak service. So this is a really important connection for expanding regional job access. Alternative six is crossing under a CSX bridge, uh, which will require additional analysis, but does include some additional complexity. Um, tunneling, again, is gonna improve the travel time the most, but does have longer implementation timelines. Um, and here you're seeing alternatives four and one utilizing tunnels here. So here we're really looking in the conversation about whether it's best to take 33rd Street to connect to Hopkins Homewood campus before connecting to Penn Station, 25th Street to connect to uh, Penn Station or North Avenue to connect to Penn Station or to stay on Green Mount Avenue and keep going south. Finally, we'll move into the south breakout slides. Um, here we're seeing the Charles and St. Paul one-way pairs are providing the highest ridership and greatest access to jobs. Greenmont Avenue is gonna provide more opportunity to support the revitalization and low-income and minority populations in that area. Alternative one, again in the pink dotted line, is using Orleans Street where it, become, where it comes back to grade. Um, it's gonna use the Orleans Street Bridge on Route 40, which would require some additional analysis as well, just looking at the loads associated with that transit infrastructure and vehicles. And um, you know, the tunneling there, again, is, is providing the greatest travel time savings, but introducing some additional challenges there as well. So here we're looking at the conversation around whether it's best to take the Charles and St. Paul Street one-way pairs serving Penn Station Mount Vernon or use Green Mount Avenue to connect to Johnston Square and the Old Town Redevelopment Project. Finally, uh, all of the alternatives um, are, are using a variety of terminal points to the south. Uh, you can see here that alternatives one and two uh, end at Otterbein, whereas three and seven, which are alternatives that are uh, BRT at surface, are ending in Harbor East. Four and five are terminating in Port Covington, and six is terminating in downtown Inner Harbor area. Um, all of the alternatives make a key connection to Metro at Charles Center, and all of the alternatives generate strong ridership in this downtown area. So there are just some different trade-offs here to explore as they all offer some, some promising analysis. And here in the discussion, we really were talking with folks about whether ending at UMC or Harbor East or Otterbein or Port Covington really made the most sense for the project. 
So pulling all that back together, um, I talked a little bit about the measures of effectiveness earlier on. Here you can see a table that summarizes the results of that analysis. Uh, you'll see the goals running down the left-hand side as a column, but across the top, you'll see several uh, rows that just give a little bit of a summary information about each of the alternatives, their number, their mode, the endpoints associated with them, so you don't need to memorize those. The length, you'll see that there's some variability in length ranging from a little over nine miles to about 12 and a half. Um, so that when we're looking at some of these measures of effectiveness at a per mile basis, we're able to normalize for the fact that they are different lengths. We also look at the different numbers of stations. You can see here that for heavy rail, there are nine stations, whereas for some of the BRTs, you know, you're seeing up to over 30 stations. So if you scan your eyes over the, the green squares, the measures of effectiveness results, here we've used a good, better, best way of looking at those results, just for simplicity's sake. The darker the green, the stronger the performance. So I'll walk through a couple of these just to orient you. Uh, for example, alternative one, you can see that it performs particularly well at the, travel tra the transit travel time between Towson and downtown, as well as access for uh, future jobs within a 45 minute commute. So you can look down the different alternatives that way, but you can also look across if you're particularly interested in say, future jobs accessible, you can then see that alternatives two and three perform the best. So there are a few different ways to look at this table, again, going by goal. So this page has the first two goals. I'll move to the next page, which presents the three, four, and five goals. Um, similarly, you're seeing the good, better, best here with a couple of exceptions. Looking at costs, we've done that with dollar signs. So one to three, uh, one being the lowest cost, three being the most expensive. Uh, so for example, you can see that alternatives two, three, five, and seven, the BRT options are the least expensive, whereas four, which is heavy rail is the most. The implementation time is also presented a little bit different here as shortest, middle, and longest. You can see two, three, four, and uh, seven again, the BRTs are the shortest, whereas BRT, uh, sorry, uh, heavy rail, alternative four is the longest. I'll hand it back to Teddy. Thanks, Kimmy. You did awesome. That was uh, a lot to cover and you did very well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, we do want to hear from you uh, about which of the alternatives you think should continue on to the next phase where we're going to do additional engineering and environmental analysis. It's also possible that in that phase, we could end up combining portions of different alternatives to make hybrid versions in that next round. So of course, we're doing virtual events like this one. Uh, but as we did with that random survey that I mentioned from our efforts last year, we're really putting a big emphasis on going out to bus stops along the corridor, talking with people who currently ride the service. One of the, the best regional transit plan events that we've really done since the start of regional transit plan, which is in 2018, 2019, was we went out and actually set up a public workshop at the Owings Mills Metro Station and had folks coming in and out of their just regular commutes, stop by, talk with project staff about what we were trying to share. We're gonna be doing a lot more of that. So we'll be actually at Fayette Street Transit Plaza later this week. Again, we're recording that, this in the middle of the public comment period. Uh, if you have ideas for where you think we should go talk to people, get in touch. You can see here, we've got email, we've got phone, we've got website, all sorts of different ways that you can get in touch with the project team. And again, the most detailed information is gonna be available on the website. So you can see how all the specific alternatives perform, across the measures of effectiveness, as well as in comparison to each other, just like what Kimmy was going over. Um, we also show which areas are served by each of the alternatives. And then we have a built-in comment box for each of the alternatives so that you can tell us what you think. And we're also bringing, again, modified versions of the same public online survey out to the bus stops, out to community meetings, so that we can get in-person comments as well and include those in our overall summary. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Again, your feedback is important to us. Uh, this 
is something that we take very seriously. Uh, we not only compile everything, but we also are going to share back with you how it informed our decision making. We're going to have actually a final report that will come out later uh, with details about everything that we heard, as well as how that influenced decisions going forward. And again, I want to emphasize right now, we are not making any specific decisions about exactly what's going to happen. We are still in the early phases. When I say decisions, I mean how we were able to choose which parts we want to learn more about. Um, again, not actually making any final implementation decisions for several years to go. And if you, again, really did uh, enjoy this presentation, you're welcome to share this with other folks. This is the best uh, effort that we could make to simulate what it was like to join us for one of our community meetings. And we appreciate you uh, staying with us. On this last slide we go to, we're gonna show you again where we are right now so that you can see that over the next few months, we're gonna be working to get a, again, set of alternatives together that we want to learn more about in the next phase of study and then deliver a final report that would summarize everything that we did during this feasibility study. Then over the next few years, we're going to do that additional analysis to get down to a single locally preferred alternative that we can then move through the federal approval process and eventually, hopefully, acquire funding so that we can actually make projects real. This is the end of today's formal presentation. We very much appreciate your time and we look forward to continuing the conversation both here online and in person at some point in the future. Thanks again.